again, welcome to Digging Deeper, and I am glad to be with you yet again uh, for another episode, and I hope that you've been having a good week wherever this video finds you or whenever it finds you. Maybe you're watching this in the distant future. That's the amazing reality of technology is you can watch these things as long as they exist on the World Wide Web. So anyway, I uh, don't know uh, what's going on with you right now, but uh, it is good to be with you. Whether you are watching this individually or listening to it individually or uh, as a group, either way, it's great to be with you. And I hope that we'll be able to find some fresh insights into God's Word and, uh, and be changed as a result of our encounter with it again, as always. So without further ado, let's get started as we continue in the series about 1 Thessalonians. Uh, however, uh, you will notice that these are not, um, are not digging deepers about 1 Thessalonians because we try to choose a, another passage for digging deeper that is the same topic as was spoken about on Sunday morning, is taught about on Sunday morning. But uh, while we choose the same topic, it's not the same passage usually. There have been occasional exceptions to that, but typically it is a different passage for variety and just to provide a different angle on the, uh, the, 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 the principles and on the topic. So first question is one that everyone can answer because it's uh, it, it's a question about which you are an expert everyone is an expert because it's opinion so the question is what did you like in the message what did you like in the message was there something that you particularly liked about the message uh, from Sunday let me give you a moment to discuss that think about that and then we'll be back in a moment you can pause the video now All right, second question, what did you disagree with in the message? What did you disagree with in the message? Was there something in the message that you just took issue with? Maybe it was something that you it was not clear to you, something that you uh, didn't, didn't understand. Uh, bring that thing up if you're in a group. Uh, mention that and see what your fellow group members will have to say about that. See what their thoughts are, because they might be able to provide some clarity on that issue for you. So... Uh, what did you disagree with in the message? Let me give you a moment to think about that, discuss that. All right, next, uh, what do you remember the most from the message? What do you remember the most from the message? Was there something that was particularly memorable, something that really stood out to you? Uh, it may not have been the bottom line. It may have been just something that was inside the message somewhere, but what, what do, do you remember the most from the message? Let me give you a moment to uh, think about that, to discuss that. All right. Well, I want to talk a little bit about um, motives. The passage in First Thessalonians that uh, we encountered today was uh, was concerned with motives. They had a lot in there about motives, and so that's what I'd like to follow up with with this digging deeper. And the first question I have for you is: Are others' motives easy for you to discern? Are other people's motives uh, easy for you to discern? Why or why not? Uh, let me ask that again. Are others' motives easy for you to discern? Why or why not? And take a moment to discuss that, to think about that, and I'll be back with you in a moment after you pause the video. All right, well, I don't know what you came up with there, but I would say that my answer would be usually not. Usually it is not easy to discern other people's motives. Uh, motives are one of those things that are concealed, that are hidden below the surface. Now, having said that, I think it's not universally true because there are some times that we can usually get a pretty good idea of people's motives. For example, if you see someone stealing a car, now I realize it could be, you can't, this is not absolute, it could be that they are commandeering that car because there is somebody in having a medical emergency and they need to take that car for temporary use to get the person to the hospital. Uh, something like that, okay? I, 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 but that is probably the exception of the rule. If you see somebody stealing a car or taking a purse from an old lady, whatever, whatever the case is, uh, probably they are up to no good. You can, you can pretty much evaluate their motives uh, at, at, at uh, first blush there. But um, I would say this, that while it may be easy to see a person's motives when they're doing wrong, 
Uh, it's a lot harder to understand or perceive a person's motives when they are doing something good. Um, because when people are doing something good, it could be that they are doing that with good motives or with bad motives. We cannot discern that just from watching what they're doing. And so uh, I would say while, while when people are doing something bad, it is easy to discern motives or relatively easy to discern their motives. Uh, when they're doing something good, it's far more difficult, far more difficult. Um, and that's something that maybe we will uh, touch on a little bit more as we go along here. Uh, so uh, second question here is, uh, where do you find motivation for living? Where do you find motivation for living? Let me pause, give you a moment to discuss that, give you a moment to think about that. All right. Um, you know, I, I think this is an interesting question uh, to, to try to grapple with where we find motivation for living because I think people find motivation for living in a number of different places, right? Um, some people are motivated, different things motivate us, right? Um, some people are motivated by um, financial gain, by money. You know, for some of us, that's, uh, that is something that really drives us. Uh, for some people, it is enjoyment. You know, people are always looking for a good time. And um, some people are, you know, that, that's the thing that drives them along is the quest for another enjoyable experience, something that they like uh, doing. Um, for some, there is achievement is the, is the motivation. Some people are always looking to see what they can achieve and see in the, the next mountain they can climb, the next hill they can, they can uh, summit. And, and so people uh, are, are motivated by achievement and, and wanting to, 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 to climb to the next level, uh, get the next promotion, whatever it is, win the next trophy. And then uh, some people are motivated by serving. Um, some people are motivated by, uh, by serving others. They want to serve others. They want to serve the Lord if, if they're a believer in Christ. And so there's a number of different motivations for living or people where people find their motivation uh, to, to go through life and uh, to, to continue on doing the things that they're doing. So uh, maybe you've come up with some better examples or better thoughts on that. Uh, as always, uh, my thoughts are not exhaustive, nor are they in any sense to be perceived or construed as the final word because uh, these are just the things that uh, hit my mind as I think about a topic. And sometimes my mind works a little bit weird. Um, and so I imagine you probably have some better insights on these. Now, let's go to a passage where we're going to talk about motives a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 1 through 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Not 1 Thessalonians, but 1 Corinthians. And this is what we read in 1 Corinthians 4, verses 1 through 5. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards. Oh, I should have stopped. I should have paused before I read it. Uh, maybe you could read this in a couple different versions, or maybe you're, you're just a couple people in your group would like to read it. Let me pause and give you an opportunity to do that, and then I'll, then I'll read it. Okay, here we go. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not therefore thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Okay, and you can see uh, motives and motivations um, <clears throat> sprinkled throughout that paragraph, throughout that passage. Uh, let, me, let me ask this question at the outset. What is the significance of being a servant of Christ. Uh, at the outset, it's he, Paul refers to him and his uh, companions as servants of Christ. So what does it mean to be a servant of Christ? And let me pause for a moment while you take a moment to discuss that. Okay. Um, I uh, don't know what you, you came up with on that one, but let me, let me share some of my thoughts here. 
Um, to be a servant of Christ, to be a servant, let's start with that. I think that's a more basic concept to grapple with. To be a servant, uh, a servant is someone who lives for the benefit of another. Okay, A servant is someone who I exists uh, to, to provide benefit to another, to his or her master, uh, historically. Now, if you expand that into the realm of service to Christ or being a servant of Christ, I think what you come up with there is that we are, it's no different, that we are living for another. That when we are servant of Christ, we are living for his glory, for his benefit, uh, to, to, to bless and honor him and to, to do what he wants. And so uh, to be a servant of Christ is to put Christ's desires for us, his purposes, his will above our own. That's what it means to be a servant of Christ in my estimation. And maybe you had some, some other thoughts on that and maybe even some personal reflections on what it means for you to serve Christ. I, 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 I suspect some of you have some good ideas on that. Um, second uh, question, what does it mean to be a faithful steward? Um, what does it mean to be a faithful steward? Uh, again, a steward is a similar uh, word to, to servant. So let me give you a moment to, to think about that. What does it mean to be a faithful steward? Okay, a faithful steward. Um, if, if I had to describe that, I would say that is consistently doing the right thing for the right reasons. To be a faithful steward is to consistently do the right thing for the right reasons. When, when Paul talks about being a faithful steward, which he says in uh, I should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. And so um, I, I think there's the idea of consistency, of, of being consistent. Paul, is, Paul and his companions are being consistent. They're consistently doing the right things for the right reasons. They're doing um, what Christ had called them to and doing it faithfully. And so being a faithful steward is... Um, it's something, it's something he really, it has the idea of dependence. It has the idea of consistency and dependability maybe is the best word. That this is, this is a, a servant. This is a steward upon which and upon whom you can depend. And so when, when Paul, when his companions were faithful stewards, it, it, they were those upon whom God could, uh, could, could depend, could trust, because they were faithful to carry out uh, their master's will and purposes for them, um, God's purposes for them, for the, the, the Lord's purposes for them. So uh, that's, I, I think, being a faithful steward is, is uh, doing consistently doing the right thing for the right reasons. Uh, another question, this, is, this goes a little deeper, uh, does what others think of us ultimately make any difference? Why or why not? Let me ask that again. Does what others think of us ultimately make any difference? Why or why not? And let me pause while you discuss that. Well, I think the answer to this one, and, and maybe you concur, is the answer is no. Ultimately, it does not matter what other people uh, think about us, what, how other people evaluate us, uh, how they look at us. It, it, that's not... That's not what matters. Um, I want to take you to a passage here, uh, to Matthew chapter 23, 27 through 28. Matthew 23, uh, 27 through 28, if I can find it. Um, and Matthew 23, 27 through 28, it says this. Um, Woe to you, Jesus is talking to the, the, the scribes, which were the law experts, the, the experts in the law of God and the Pharisees, uh, which were a religious sect that were the uh, religious conservatives in Israel, basically. But he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but it, within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness, uncleanness rather. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you 
are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Now, those are pretty strong words. Jesus really let these scribes and Pharisees have it in this passage. Uh, but I think what he had to say was, was very, very, uh, very important to, for us to realize um, how this relates to uh, motivation and motives. So I think what he's saying there is, is, you know, if you looked at a scribe, if you looked at a Pharisee of Jesus' day, people's perception of these folks were that they were the, God's favorites, that they were righteous, that they were doing everything by the book, they were doing everything the way God would want them to, that they were just absolutely fantastic. Uh, they represented God in all the right ways, and they followed him as closely as possible. But Jesus, who incidentally and different than everyone else that's ever walked this earth, could see into people's hearts and look directly at their motives, said, no, uh, you do this because you like the attention, you like, to be, you like to be well regarded, you like people to respect you. And Jesus comes along and he says, even though you look beautiful on the outside, even though you, you look like you've been whitewashed, I mean, glowing white in the sunlight inside, uh, you are anything but pure. In fact, inside you're like a sepulcher. You're like a crypt full of decaying bones and flesh, dead people, corpses on the inside. Now, that was Jesus' evaluation of the scribes and the Pharisees when he looked at their motive, motives. And so, again, this is an example of how we cannot see people's motives. Jesus could, and he, even though, said that even though these people look fantastic, and, and there may be people in our lives that we think, my goodness, these people are just fantastic people. They, they do everything right. And uh, what we find out is that ultimately it's God's evaluation of them that matters, not our evaluation, because we can't evaluate correctly. All we can see is what's on the outside. And we might have been commending and probably would have been commending the Pharisees and the scribes and thinking, man, these people are just fantastic. But in reality, God's evaluation, God's perception of them was way, way, way different, dramatically different, because uh, they were doing what they did for the wrong reasons. Okay. So, ne next question. Does our self-assessment ultimately make any difference? Does our self-assessment ultimately make any difference? Now, let me explain what I'm asking there. So we've already touched on the fact that what others think about us um, and what we think about others ultimately doesn't make any difference, right? So people may look at you and, um, and, and think something about you, but ultimately that doesn't make a hill of beans worth of difference. Um, ultimately what matters is what God thinks about you and what God thinks about me. That is the thing that really counts at the end of the day. In fact, uh, back here in 1 Corinthians, uh, that is, he, he, Paul says, and just to underscore that, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. So uh, what Paul says is it, it doesn't matter. It does not matter what people um, say about us, think about us. Ultimately, it doesn't matter what we think about people or say about people, ultimately. Um, ultimately, it is what the Lord's evaluation is of us and of other people. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, be discerning. That doesn't even mean that we shouldn't judge people. Now, that's a controversial thing. We sometimes think that when Jesus said, do not judge, that is a blanket statement about uh, judging in general. Well, you can't go through life without judging, you know. If, if somebody is um, consistently doing things that are injurious to others, uh, we, we need to judge that and say, you know what, uh, that person is out up to no good. I mean, they're, they're hurting people consistently. That, that is a judgment, okay? That's judging people. What Jesus was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, do not judge, he was talking about a hypocritical type of judgment that pays no attention to our own, uh, our own error and our own wrongdoing but only to others, okay? That's, that's the context of that. But, uh, but, but 
we cannot judge motives. We can judge actions, and we should judge actions. We cannot judge motives. So uh, Paul says, back to, I kind of got, got back to the previous question there in a sense, but the question here is, does our self-assessment, now that, that's a little deeper. In fact, that's a pretty deep question. Did I give you a moment to think about it? I can't remember. Let me give you a moment to think about it if I haven't. Let me stop. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry if I didn't give you a chance to think about that. But anyway, our self-perception or our uh, self-assessment, ultimately it doesn't even make any difference, I would say. And I say that because uh, here in, um, in, in this passage here, it, it, he says, Paul says, um, I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. So Paul says, even though I don't know that my motives are wrong, ultimately that's not what matters. It's, it's God's evaluation of my motives. It's, it's sometimes we are not even aware of why we do what we do. I think that's what it said. In fact, Jeremiah, remember, he says, um, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Sometimes we do things with mixed motives. Sometimes we do things for partially the right reason, but partially the wrong reasons. And, uh, and, and Paul says, you know what? I can't even, I'm not fully qualified to even evaluate my own motives. The Lord ultimately is the one who has to evaluate my motives. And this is a pretty deep thought because we might think we're, well, I'm pretty doggone good at judging my own motives, at evaluating why I do what I do. But uh, Paul says, no, I, I can't even evaluate why I do what I do fully. And so I have to entrust uh, that evaluation to the Lord and seek, I, I think this is, well, we'll get to this in a minute, uh, what I was going to say um, about that. I don't want to transgress on my next question, but ultimately we do not know. Let me, let me show you this in scripture. Luke chapter 18, Luke chapter 18. And uh, Luke 18, uh, nine through 14. Uh, this, is, this is what we find here. And uh, it says, uh, this is a, a, a story Jesus told. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So these are people who had a positive self-evaluation of their motives, right? And Jesus said, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift his eyes to heaven. He beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. You notice this Pharisee had a lousy self-assessment. This Pharisee thought that he was good. Not only did other people probably think this Pharisee was good, he thought his motives were good. He thought he did everything for the right reason. He thought he was just pleasing God's socks off and God was lucky to have him on his team. Jesus' assessment was way, way, way different than that. The Pharisee thought he was great. Jesus said, uh, now you, you see this guy and you see this tax collector who realized how bankrupt he was before God, that the tax collector was the one who went home justified, that the tax collector was the one who was a despised individual, right? Nobody, nobody had any question about a tax collector's motives. They knew that they were swindlers. But the tax collector went home justified. Um, God considered the tax collector righteous, but considered the Pharisee who would expect anything but to be unrighteous, to be unrighteous. So we, even we can't evaluate our motives, but, but here in this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, Paul says that God is ultimately the one who evaluates even our motives, the reasons that we do the things we do. Now, that raises some questions probably is well, well what if you don't even know what i'm doing how do we are why i'm doing things uh, how does that all work out well that brings us to our last question here how can our motives be purified let me pause while you answer that question how can our motives be purified 
All right, uh, how can our motives be purified? So that's, that's the natural question that comes up because uh, we've, we've come to this question about uh, you know, this issue. We can't evaluate our motives. We don't even know why we do what we do. Well, God knows why we do what we do. And so if he's the one who knows, I would submit to you that we should seek his assessment on, on our motives that we should say, God, I don't know why I'm doing this. Uh, I mean, I know why I'm doing this good thing. I don't even know uh, if my motives are pure before you, but God, I want you to purify uh, me. I want you to, um, I, I, I want you to uh, address the bad motives in my life. In fact, the psalmist did this, and I didn't have this written down in my notes, but it just sprang to my mind uh, to see this in action. Psalm 139. Um, the last two verses in Psalm 139, uh, verses 29, uh, 23 and 24, it says, Search me, O God, know my thought, know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there is any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. The psalmist there uh, sought God's assessment. Um, David sought the assessment of God. He said, I, I don't even know my own motives. But God, I need, I know that you do, and I need you to purify my motives. I need you to work in them. Another thought I had on this was um, secrecy. You know, um, when, when we do something good, one thing Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount was don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And I think that's more than just being secret to others. It's almost to have a, dis, a disconnection between what we do, not to think about what we do and to hold on to that and think, my goodness, look, look at what I've done. I feel good about myself. But to just, just let it slip into the sands of our forgetfulness after we do good. Um, because ultimately, again, uh, God knows our motives. And the more that we assess ourselves and think that we're doing everything right, it's, it's quite possible that we're uh, thinking about it wrongly. And God's the one who judges our motives. So what are the takeaways? I and mean, what, what, what would I suggest is uh, we can't rightly evaluate why other people do what they do. Okay, we just, we can't, we're not capable of that. That's beyond our pay grade. What's more, we can't even fully and properly evaluate why we do what we do uh, when we do something that could be perceived as good. Um, we can do a good thing for the wrong reasons and people do that all the time. But the Lord who knows our motives is the one that we need to seek for his assessment on our motives so that we will do things from a pure heart that honors him. And I think that is uh, probably the takeaway for today. Um, seek God and ask him to purify your motives, to search you and um, to know our heart and to uh, point out if there's anything that is displeasing to him and to lead us in the way everlasting. Let me pray, and then we will wrap up. Thank you for being uh, with us again. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this day. Father, we have uh, deep, our, our hearts are deep waters. There's mixed motives. There's different reasons we do what we do, uh, different motives, different rationales. Father, you can plumb those depths. You know what's going on in our hearts. And so, Heavenly Father, we ask that you would, uh, you would search our hearts, that you would uh, point out to us uh, where the wicked ways may be that we don't even perceive and that others may never see. And that, Father, that you would purify our hearts and our motives so that we might walk in a way that honors you. Thank you that you know our hearts. And we ask that you would shape them and direct them toward you. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. All right. Well, thank you again for um, being with us, uh, for digging deeper. I hope you have a great week, and I will look forward to being with you again next time. See you.